Test one, two, three.
Anyways, whether or not there's any construction efficiency, you know, if you don't have to do all the traffic management. Okay, good morning, and I'd like to bring the uh, planning and works uh, committee meeting to order, please. Um, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Um, we have a, a delegation uh, today, uh, as you've been informed uh, previously. And so I'll ask uh, Mr. Marshall if he would come forward, or representatives of uh, one property, or WAM, for their presentation. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Matt Campbell. I'm here from uh, Zelenka Priamo. We're the land use planning consultants on behalf of One Properties. And I'm here to speak to you today regarding uh, access to Fisher Holman Road for uh, 1250, 1270, and 1314 Fisher Holman Road. Uh, we were previously in front of this committee uh, just about a year ago, and there was a resolution that was passed that permitted a full turns access to this site. And um, we're here in front of you today to ask for a revised motion. And the reason that we're here is because for the past year, we've been attempting to work with staff. And, uh, and this is based on the conditions that uh, the committee and the region um, gave us uh, a little over a year ago. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to come to an agreement in order to implement this access. So uh, we're here to, uh, to ask for a revised motion on that today. Just to uh, refresh everyone's minds uh, as to this particular development, it's a, a large mixed-use development with a range of uh, commercial uses, including a grocery store, office commercial. Um, and importantly, there are approximately 650 um, units that are going to be built here. And as of today, approximately two of those are rental units. We think this is going to be a great asset to the, uh, to the city, and um, we're really excited about this development. And, and attaining uh, the proper access is an integral component of this, uh, if, of this development. Um, some of the, uh, the images you see here, this is, uh, is, this is the development. There's a current uh, building proposed at the corner of Fisher, Holman and Bleams, and a, a range of uh, commercial buildings as well, and uh, three large apartment buildings on the south end of the site. Uh, we know that there is going to be a trail running along the north side of Strasbourg Creek, and part of the access that we're proposing here will facilitate a pedestrian crossing uh, going from the west side to the east side and vice versa for pedestrians using that trail. And this is what the, the access uh, will look like. This image was previously provided to the committee, and this is the proposed full turns access that we're, uh, we're looking for. And we think this is the optimal solution for this intersection. Um, it, uh, it promotes pedestrian crossings and isn't going to have any sort of detrimental effect on the flow of traffic on, on Fisher-Holman. Let me see that access again. So in, uh, in moving forward with this development, we're, we're at a bit of a standstill, unfortunately. As I mentioned, uh, we've been working with the regional staff for about the past year through the various uh, planning applications that have been brought forward for these lands. And unfortunately, uh, we cannot come to a resolution. And, um, and it's putting this project in serious jeopardy. And so what we're here today to ask for is a revised motion in which uh, my client, One Properties, the developer of these lands, will pay 100% of the cost for a signalized uh, access, that's a traffic signal, uh, which is to be installed and operational in the retail portion of the project, that's the southerly access on fisher Holman Road. And we're anticipating that this access will be permanent. Additionally, uh, One Properties is proposing a $500,000 contribution to the region towards um, planned pedestrian crossings and intersection improvements at this location. 
And again, this is a result of working with staff for the past year and trying to get a resolution to this particular um, access problem. And we believe that a revised motion from committee and regional council will facilitate the implementation of this access and allow this development uh, to proceed. So again, we're asking for that uh, revised motion from you this morning. Be uh, happy to answer any questions. We have uh, Jim Goff from WSP, who is here to answer any traffic questions, as well as uh, two representatives from one properties. So we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thanks, uh, Matt. Uh, uh, Chair uh, Redmond. Thank you, Chair Galloway. Can you just speak to the impact this will have? I'm over here. If you're looking. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> the impact this will have on the project, given that later on we have a report that talks about um, some First Nations findings on uh, the construction site of Fisher Holman, and that piece of Fisher Holman will be held up for a substantial period of time. Absolutely, and we were discussing that particular issue with staff not too long ago, and we do understand that there, there is an archaeological site that requires some work. Um, in terms of this particular access, we're still working out the nuances of how that is actually going to impact it, and um, long term, we believe it's just going to be a timing issue. Well, we're doing everything in our power to make sure that this access goes uh, as quickly as, as possible. We recognize that there is a process that has to go through um, with, uh, with archaeological assessments and we're working through the details with that. So you're acknowledging that, that you have, um, that they're taking this into your planning, but um, does resolving this intersection impact how you go forward on um, the development of, of your property, I guess is what I was looking for. Yes, fundamentally, it, it impacts uh, the, the development of the whole lands. And the reason why it does is because there are um, purchase options in place for these lands right now that are contingent on this access. And the conditions that have been imposed um, through staff, and as I mentioned, we've been working with staff for the past year, uh, it puts our client in an untenable position in which the access arrangement uh, isn't viable from, um, from a planning and economic perspective. And, and just one additional point. You said there are rental as of today, so I'm assuming that that's a bit of a work in progress and the number of rental units on this footprint could change when the development is actually completed. That's correct. There are, uh, as I mentioned, there's approximately 250 units that are planned uh, for rental units today, and that's within the 650 units that are earmarked for this development. That number could very well increase. And decrease. Due, due to the, the zoning that we have on the site, I believe it's unlikely that it would decrease. Okay, thank you. Councillor Strickland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, uh, I'm just looking at this correspondence from, um, from Mr. Marshall dated um, February 28th. And was it really over a year ago, February 6, 2019, when we passed this resolution? That's a, that's a rhetorical question. I guess, uh, I, I guess I'm surprised that um, it's taken us that long. And then when I look at the resolution that we adopted, compared to the resolution that um, One Properties is requesting today, I'm, I'm assuming that, um, that they would convey the land required for a roundabout at a future date if required as per the original resolution. So I can speak to those two points. Yes, it has been just about a year, or sorry, actually over a year, and um, yes. so. In, in preparing the site plan for the one property site, we've already accommodated lands for a potential future roundabout. Um, it required uh, some rejigging of buildings to make sure that we could dedicate that land, but yes, that has been accommodated for in the site plan. Okay, so I, I would just uh, add that to the proposed resolution as a third bullet, just to be clear, that the land would be conveyed as required for roundabout at a future date. So when we get to that on the floor, uh, Mr. Chair, I, uh, uh, I would uh, move that resolution at the appropriate time and then speak to it. Okay. Um, uh, 
Councillor Harris. <clears throat> yeah, that was my uh, question. What exactly would be the modification to the original resolution? So three, um, again, is the additional clarity that is needed to, to, to be provided here. So I would, I would second that uh, motion when it, when it comes. Okay, I'm not, I've got no other speakers. Uh, I have a few questions. So, and I think council needs to be aware of this, is that uh, currently uh, there is an appeal uh, at LPAT on this particular property, which, depending on its outcome, could substantially change uh, the future development of this property. And so my question is, I mean, in the, in the event of an unsuccessful LPAT, uh, decision, um, what happens um, to the project and then what happens to even this intersection? It could all go away or it could change substantially. Uh, the property would have to be redesigned. I, I, I don't know what are the implications of an unsuccessful LPAT decision, which is long overdue and anticipated <clears throat> any day, I suppose, but then that's, it's been anticipated for a number of months any day. So uh, what would be the, uh, the impact on the decision that we're making today uh, in that event? Uh, Mr. Chair, there's so two points we'd like to make. Uh, I'll answer your question first, and then um, Jeff Marshall here from One Properties would like to address the issue of um, of the land conveyance regarding the roundabout. So, in regards to your question about the LPAT appeal, uh, we fully anticipate that LPAT will come back in a decision in our favor, and there would be no modification necessary to the plan. Um, but recognizing that is it is within LPAT's power to change any of the zoning regulations that uh, the city has approved here. Potentially, there could be a require for a, a redesign of this, um, but I think that's highly unlikely. And we, and so, you know, if if that were the case, then we would redesign in, in compliance with uh, with El Paso's decision. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think it would change the fundamentals of this access uh, to any significant degree. Okay. Marshall. Good morning, Jeff Marshall, One Properties. Yes, just to follow up on that. Yes. Obviously, we're very confident we're going to get a positive decision on this. In essence, the appeal really was, our opinion was it was a competition appeal and uh, it was a pretty brief um, LPAT hearing. So it's just a timing issue for us. Um, again, so we are here today. It is important for us to move forward with this, just to reiterate, um, because we do have some purchase sale agreements as well as uh, anchor tenant leases that are contingent and have conditions related to having this access, having some certainty to this. That's why we're back here today. Um, and hopefully you can just, you know, this all of this would be conditioned on obviously receiving a positive decision from the LPAT. Um, I, I think Matt did summarize it quite well. I mean, what we're hearing, what we're here to do today is to sort of clarify um, some of the items from the previous resolution and really sort of just, again, provide some certainty that on the traffic signal, really we're coming back and looking at this as a permanent solution. Um, we have our support from our traffic engineer that this is not going to have any undue cause on um, the traffic on Fisher Hallman. We've done our analysis there. And I think we've shown that there is superior benefits um, to having that uh, signal there in, term, in, in replace of a roundabout for the benefits that it ha has with pedestrian crossings. Um, we, we know that there's some planned seniors on the west side of the road. Uh, the idea, we've designed our project with the city and region as well to have a pedestrian oriented type project. And so we feel strongly that having a, an actually traffic signal at this location with a pedestrian crossing makes the most sense. It won't have any negative effect on the traffic flow along Fisher Hallman. So just back to what Sean's comment was. So what we're looking at today is really confirming the approval for the traffic signal. And that would be in this case, is just a permanent solution. And then we are providing then a contribution really at the region's discretion to use that could enhance that crossing because we know that there was some pedestrian signals that were gonna be just planned just south of that. We're saying, why not just combine it all, have a really good intersection um, that's safe for everybody to cross. Um, and so that's sort of the pro proposal here today. Um, so really, the, in previously, what the, our proposal was, but it was a future scenario for a roundabout um, that really, in our eyes, was there's no need to rip out a perfectly f uh, functioning signal. 
um, if it's, it's working fine. So what we're here to do today is to, to provide that certainty, have the signal approved, and then move forward. So I just, a tweak to, I think, what was recommended was I, I don't really feel that the land conveyance is necessary under these circumstances any longer, and uh, that's, that's our request here today. Okay. So um, uh, I'd like to just uh, say to council or to committee that um, I think council in its, uh, in its wisdom last year uh, has put ourselves into a bit of a, a conundrum uh, on this particular issue because the resolution seems to be quite clear that um, we were going to allow a signalized intersection and then require the developer to uh, pay the full cost of a future roundabout if and when it would be ever necessary. Uh, the cost of that roundabout now has been estimated at $8.5 million uh, with land acquisition and um, all, all the various things that could be involved. The land acquisition is not their land, it's the land on the other side of the street from an adjacent developer who of course is not going to donate their land to the, uh, to the project. Um, so we have a motion on the books that says that. So the dilemma is really like even at that price, how would you secure that for a future decision? 20 years from now, or whenever that would be, that a roundabout might be might be uh, anticipated. Uh, uh, the, the developer is probably long gone. Um, uh, letters of credit for a, a, an extended period of time of that order is is really for for a for a, a roundabout that may never be necessary, and in fact, staff are telling me is likely never necessary. So, um, so we have a motion on the books. We almost really need, if we wanted to change the decision in some manner, we almost need a motion to reconsider. Um, uh, but the other thing that's in the background on this is the question that I asked about the LPAT. <laughs> so if the LPAT is not successful, all of this discussion may be for naught. Who knows? Um, so what I might suggest is that we defer the matter to staff to write a report that then would come back with possibly a different recommendation um, uh, based on current circumstances and we can deal with it in that particular manner. Or I'm at your hands because um, we do have a motion on the books that the developer would pay for 100% of the... Of Are you the still with the delegation question, the delegation about the No, I should have asked them to sit down. Yeah, I have no more questions. Well, I questions. well we can... Uh, I've only got Councillor <coughs> Strickland, so uh, I can ask the delegations to sit down. I should have asked you to uh, sit down for now. We can get you back up if there's some more questions. Uh, Councillor Strickland. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in terms of... Uh, motion of reconsideration uh, uh, I'm not sure I don't have a encyclopedic uh, memory of Robert's rules of order but uh, I think if if we made uh, this motion today it simply would uh, replace the previous motion and even if we were going to motion to reconsideration uh, was it a recorded vote uh, I, I think that we're uh, unnecessarily entangling uh, you know uh, complicating a matter uh, I think the, the question before us is that it has been over a year and this is a development uh, that has a grocery store as an anchor, is a retail development that's required in the south end of Kitchener and additionally has up to 650 apartment units. And we know how low the vacancy rate is. We know we need the stock for apartment units and, and I think we may have put ourselves into, into, the own, into our own jackpot here. Uh, I was, uh, I heard along the line that the cost of the roundabout was substantive, but I had no idea it was $8.5 million. So I don't think it was the uh, intent of, of committee or council to tie the, the developer to a potential future roundabout that by staff's own admission may never be required. So, so I think that, um, 
you know, we simply deal with the recommendation that is suggested before us, I would move it. We have the debate, be done with it and move on and, and let's help this developer get this development built and build these apartment units that our community sorely needs. And I'm fine with that, I'm in your hands. I'm just pointing out the possible need for a reconsideration. I, don't, I haven't asked for a ruling on it. Councillor Lorenz. Well, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly support uh, uh, Councillor Strickland's uh, initiative and, and motion on this, but I'm just wondering why has it taken a year for this? Why, why hasn't staff come back to us and said there's a problem? And I mean, we passed this resolution that looked pretty clear to me that we would just move forward on this if there were issues. I'm quite surprised that we've we've waited a year before we haven't even heard from from our staff, but from from the developer. So. I mean, I, you know, because you get the emails as well as I do with some of the problems that, that is happening along Fisher Holm and further south up to, up, up, up to, uh, uh, what's the far um, here, on <laughs> here on road. I, I grew up in that area and I still can't remember those cross streets. So, you know, I, I think that um, if, if there's an issue uh, with the adjacent property owner, I think the city of Kitchener will look at, at uh, through, the, through site plan and, and probably ask for those lands. Uh, uh, I mean, everybody has to make contributions when they're doing, doing developments. And if the land needs to be, uh, be secured for future uh, roundabouts, I think that's up to the, the city or, the, or us to, uh, to sit down with them and say that we need that like we always have, so I don't see that as an issue. I would agree with Councillor Strickland. I think um, we need to get as much um, um, rental housing on the market as we possibly can. And there may be even an opportunity for us to put some affordable housing in, in this development. So we need to move forward on this. And like I said, I'm quite surprised that it's, it's coming back to us through a developer saying that it, we've passed this a year ago and they haven't made any headway on it. And I, I really would like to hear from staff on what some of their issues are. I don't want to place blame, but to me, this seems quite unusual. Mr. Schmidt? I think the main, the main issue and delay in this has been that a staff field council resolution was very clear. It said 100% of the funds for the roundabout were to be paid for by the developer. And, council, and staff are bound to... Uh, to implement council's recommendations. Uh, I believe the developer didn't believe that that resolution was clear, that was passed, and didn't believe that land costs and other items were included. So we've done a lot of work to fully develop what is an actual cost of a, a roundabout there, which is in the range of six to eight and a half million dollars, so about six million if you constructed it now, probably closer to eight and a half if you constructed it in, in the future, so I think staff were trying to comply with what <laughs> council requested us to do, which was secure 100% of the cost of this roundabout, which probably was substantially higher than any of us thought at the time. There's also been the ongoing issue of the LPAT and the appeal process, so there hasn't been, I would say, a huge urgency to get this done. It hasn't been necessary. The developer was not being held up in any way at this. We, we understand we're close to uh, the LPAT hopefully being settled one way, way, way or the other. Uh, we have been working on and looking at, can we bring a report forward with this to try and resolve this? Uh, we've been preempted by, by the developer. I would say staff are, are generally fine if council wants to give us a direction to install the, uh, the traffic signal as they did, that's fine. We will go ahead and install that, that traffic signal. We don't feel a roundabout is necessary. In fact, the roundabout and the offer to pay for the roundabout was made by the developer, not by staff. So, so I think today our recommendation would be uh, send it back to us, give us an opportunity to write a, a report. We would come back with a recommendation, I think probably very similar to what the developer has proposed, but we'll be able to lay all those issues out for, for council's consideration. Councilor Lorenz. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so um, the 
first recommendation was to, um, they'll pay 100% of the cost related to the installation of the traffic signal. So we have all that planned out, all that work is done. We can, we can implement the, uh, the signals. We're ready to go on that. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Schmidt? I'm not sure if, I, I doubt if a design is done, but I don't well, think- Wasn't that some of the instruction you had a year ago to, to do that? Uh, we're prepared to move forward with the design. We, we can do that relatively quickly. Again, we're not holding up the developer. We were trying to implement all of the instructions from council okay, I, to I get, get, get the traffic signal in place. So the number the two, the big problem you said we're having, you're, you're having was securing funding for the roundabout, but at the end of your statement, you said you don't feel the roundabout's warranted. So I uh, kind of puzzled as why we were trying to wangle uh, out how much it's gonna cost when we don't even think it'll ever be uh, built because it's not warranted. To be clear, if, if you're asking, staff also do not believe that the traffic signal is warranted. Staff's original recommendation on this was for so right a right in, in right out. Right out. Yeah, Council gave clear direction, yeah. put in a traffic signal, and also clear direction, secure the funding for a roundabout. So that is what we've been trying to do. Like it, it's... We well, you know a right in, right out wouldn't work, right? Or do, or do um, we have this discussion on... Well, all right. We've had that discussion. We've had that discussion. <laughs> we've had that discussion and... Okay. Council was clear. Council gave us the direction. We are truly trying to implement that direction. And uh, okay, so you don't think waiting a year is not is not hasn't been? You guys have been on top of this for the whole time. We shouldn't be surprised that it's taken a year to get us to where we are. Because I'm quite surprised that we're here. I, I would say this this development and this area of Fisher Hallman has been particularly complicated by. This development, other developments in the area, the fact that we're dealing with Aboriginal archaeological issues there. Right. So that this area has been extremely complicated right from square one and continues to be so. So, so you don't think six months ago we should have got an update on where we're at and how things are moving? And We have been trying to resolve this issue with, with the developer. Okay, but you don't think we were, we should have known that you were trying to do that? Because to be honest with you, I was quite surprised that we've been at this a year and we haven't heard one thing. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Councillor Foxton. Uh, thank you, and through the chair. Um, it does appear to be that this is a complicated situation and understanding the staff have to follow the letter of the law based upon what council tells them. And if council said, and, and they have the documentation from the developer that the developer is going to pay for the roundabout, Council must move on the basis that that is going to be paid for. Now the developer was unaware of the actual cost. There's been mitigating circumstances that have changed things. The LPAC decision, which was expected numerous times in the past year and still has not come forward. I don't think the staff has perfectly left this aside or not done their due diligence. I think the circumstances, the multiple circumstances has caused us to be in this situation and reviewing the situation to see do we hold a developer financially responsible for a roundabout that may not ever come, or that comes 20 years down the road? How do we do that? Do we get a letter of credit, and what amount? And will the developer be around in 20 years? Chair Redmond. Uh, thank you, Chair Galloway. I would just say, um, for the information of council, that I've been in constant contact with uh, one property, and LPAT has driven through so many absolute final deadlines. And I think all of us thought that the resolution of the LPAT um, decision would have gone a long way to clarifying this. I'd also say that I think that this needs to be a political decision. This isn't something that we can refer to staff. Staff can um, look at the design, they can give us um, an accurate costing, but the reality was it was a political decision to go with the proposal by the developer and staff um, interpreted it very literally. I have to say, personally, I didn't foresee the acquisition of somebody else's land as part of the roundabout. Um, we have worked with a developer looking at several scenarios. None of them have been acceptable. So I think it's appropriate that it's back here at this table um, for us to make the decision and give direction to staff. But I would just reiterate that uh, we have been working with the developer over the past year. It isn't that anybody let it language and certainly the developer didn't, they've given their best effort to try to resolve this and staff have done what they felt was in uh, their purview to do. And it, I think it was a higher price tag as Mr. Schmidt said than anybody thought. So I think it is appropriate for this council to make the decision and move forward. 
And as of today, I, I look to Jeff, but LPAT is still pending. We still don't have a decision, right? Correct. I think the last absolute line in the sand was the middle of December 2019, and that came and went. Councillor Bivanovic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I will uh, support the recommendation that's, that's before us. Um, I think, um, I mean, some of us certainly were aware that the developer was trying to work with, with regional staff in, in trying to, to find a solution. However, I will say that I, I do agree with, with Councillor Lorenz that a year is far too long that for there to be an impasse such as this and staff not to have brought it back to, uh, to, to council for clarification or direction. Um, the reality is we, we know that there's a housing shortage in, uh, in our region. Um, and the other reality is we know that there is, at the end of the day, only every project has limited dollars attached to it, right? There's, a, there's an expected margin attached to it. So the, the more that we keep sending people back to developers and so on, which, I mean, this is getting into a bigger question around, I think, a, a need for, for looking at our, our, our broader handling of, of, of developments. Um, we're doing that, I know, at the city right now. And I think we need to do it here as well. Um, because at the end of the day, we're, we're stuck in this position between community expectations, financial realities, um, and and trying to find this balance. And the the only people that that often are, are doing well, and I'll do respect to all to the consultants in the business, because you're an important part of the process. But is every time we send back, it's just it's just adding costs there, and and moving, making it harder and harder to get the kinds of things we want to be part of projects, to actually be part of uh, the developments that we want to see. I'm, uh, I'm certainly supportive to, to move it forward. I guess the only question I, I, I will ask, I mean, I'd rather deal with it today if we can, but I'm also a stickler when it comes to, 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 um, to process. And so, I mean, I think we do need to understand when did we last deal with this? If it was during this term of council, is this a motion that um, would require us to have a, uh, a motion to reconsider? Um, in which case, you know, we, we can do that at council. This has to come back to council anyway, even if we dealt with it today. Um, but, um, and, and I agree with Chair Redmond that this is a political decision. Councillor Strickland. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I'd like to put the motion on the floor from uh, page 124 of, of our agenda today, the two bullets there. If I can get a seconder, I'll speak to it briefly. Second by Councillor Harris. Okay, great. Thanks. So, um, obviously, there's been... Uh, I don't know if you call it a process breakdown, but uh, we have, uh, I think, unnecessarily complicated the matters based on trying to do what we thought was the right thing when we dealt with this over a year ago. And staff is obviously mandated to do what uh, council directs them to do as per the resolution. I think it's, it's, it's too bad that we didn't get an update throughout the process because obviously staff has got some frustration and we also have a frustrated developer because it's very, unusual for a developer to come back to us and say we need to we need a political decision here to help resolve this situation so regardless of all that toing and froing you know i asked myself you know what's what is the right thing to do today and i think the right thing to do today is to help this developer get on with this development build this retail component i know there's other variables but let's give them the traffic signal Let's accept the $500,000 and let's move on and let them get to work on building this development that's needed in the South End of Kitchener. I don't think we need to, you know, add any more layers of process onto this than what the developer and staff have already experienced. We have an opportunity here today to move it forward. Uh, let's get on with it. Uh, earlier I mentioned that I would uh, add a third bullet about a conveyance, making sure that the developer would uh, convey the property to future date, but after listening to the discussion and hearing from staff themselves that they don't think a roundabout's likely ever going to be necessary, so why complicate it even further by adding 
uh, you know, that they would agree to convey a roundabout when necessary. That would be I just think it would just encumber the property uh, unnecessarily. So my view is, um, you know, let, let's take the traffic stone we're going to pay for. Let's take the $500,000. Let them go to work. Uh, let's build a retail shopping plaza that's needed and affordable housing that's sorely needed. Thank you. Uh, so there's a motion on the floor uh, to um, to do as Councillor Strickland, Councillor Strickland has moved it, seconded by um, Councillor Harris. Uh, speaking speaking to the motion, then uh, Chair Redmond. Thank you, Chair Galloway. I just have two questions. One is I'd just like to clarify: uh, affordable housing was not mentioned; it was rental housing. So just so we don't uh, mix those two things up, and um, I guess I would just ask staff for direction. Um, I think everybody was clear when we voted on this last time. It was a little bit like the referendum question in Quebec. Everybody was very clear, but everybody had a different interpretation. So in the spirit of being precise, do we have a valuation that the developer can go away with that says, yes, this is the price tag for 100% cost for the traffic signal? Um, who can answer that? I mean, the, probably the developer can best answer that. I, I believe they're fully aware of what a traffic signal costs. Mr. Jeff Marshall again, One Properties. Uh, yeah, we've been working through some letters of credit costing previously. I, I would say uh, the signal itself is going to be in the range of two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000, which we're prepared to... Uh, pay for as well as the five hundred thousand dollar contribution to enhance that by means necessary and at the discretion of staff or or council. Thank you, Councillor Herb. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what the result of this motion is if the if one property loses the appeal. Well, I, I, the question is, what if the LP had? Uh, well, then it's. You know, there could be further process uh, associated with that uh, to uh, to appeal that decision or whatever. Um, uh, I think it's speculative whether or not the project would go ahead, but then it would be it would become almost, almost redundant. You know, the intersection wouldn't go ahead, the signalization wouldn't go ahead, um, and quite possibly in the future the property would be redesigned and we would have another proposal in front of us to deal with. So uh, this is not going to get built without, uh, this intersection is not going to get built without a, a favorable result from LPAT. So the region won't be putting so, any no, more I, money I, into No, I don't think there's a concern in that regard, but there is that scenario. But uh, <coughs> Councillor Armstrong? Yeah, I, I thought I heard the developer say that even if they lose it, the LPAT, it probably wouldn't change the intersection that much, if, if at all. It, it, I don't think it's necessary, Mr. Campbell. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, um, that's, that's, I mean, that was something that I heard, but um, I mean, I agree we should uh, go ahead with this today. Um, my only comment is that it's amazing how the changing of a name of a unit to LPAT and how efficient, more efficient they are. Councilor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Schantz. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting discussion. I'm in favor of the motion, but just a point of order. Um, can we clarify if we need to somehow take the other motion off the books? Well, I think that that's, that's a good question, and I'm, I'm kind of in your hands. I think there's an argument to be made that the motion that was passed a year ago um, may not have anticipated all of this and was probably not the intent of council to encumber the developer with those kinds of costs, and, um, and that we could just expedite the whole process now and, and, and get on with it. And, uh, it would seem, I mean, I, I haven't done a straw vote or anything, but it would seem that there, there's a fair bit of support for the, the motion on the floor, uh, which then would suggest that if we needed, a, if anybody thought there was a motion to, 
needed to reconsider, it would probably pass as well. But of course, we would have to, uh, there'd be some process associated with that. We have at least one member of committee is, is not here. Uh, I'm gonna go with Mr. Murray first. And um, yeah, I see Ms. Arnold wants to, to jump in. So, um, you know, I think we're getting a clear sense of where council wants to go. So if you pass the motion today, then what I would suggest is uh, uh, Ms. Arnold and, uh, and, and the clerk will look at, you know, what process do we need to put in place between now and council? And council can deal with it, you know, at the council meeting in the appropriate way. So if, if it needs a motion to reconsider, then council can deal with that next Wednesday. So that's my suggestion is, you know, council, do what you want to do today. Staff will look at procedurally what needs to be done to, uh, you know, make that happen appropriately and we'll deal with that on Wednesday. Deborah, do you want to add to that? Deborah? Y yes, I agree with Mr. Murray. I mean, just to be crystal clear so that if anyone ever is looking back at the, the record, um, I would suggest that the, uh, the recommendation that goes before council next week would tag ex crystal clear language that it's intended to supersede and replace uh, the February 2019 resolution as it, as it pertains to the to the uh, roundabout, just so that there's a, a clear record, you know, when uh, years from now or even months from now, someone's looking at the two resolutions and wondering which one prevails. So that would be acceptable. Uh, that would be acceptable, uh, Councillor Strickland. Yeah. Add that to the uh, the recommendation. Sorry, add specifically that um, it replaces this, this replaces the motion that was passed on February sixth, mm -hmm. two thousand and nineteen. Sure. Okay, I have no further questions. A recorded vote has been asked for. So the resolution, just to be clear, is to um, uh, accept uh, Councillor Strickland's uh, recommendation, the $500,000 uh, contribution, uh, removing the um, requirement for the roundabout uh, and so on and 100% uh, cost of the traffic signal and uh, the uh, reference to this replacing the February 6, 2019 uh, resolution of, of council. All in favor? Oh, record vote, yes, sorry. So hang on. Ready? 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 Okay, ready. Go ahead and vote. So that's, I can see it, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's, uh, yeah, so that's passed. Oh. <coughs> yep. Okay, it's carried. All right. <clears throat> okay, we'll carry on with the agenda then. Uh, the next item are the, uh, the consent agenda. Uh, there are three items on the consent agenda. Does anybody wish to discuss any one of those? Seeing none, uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. Councillor Armstrong, Councillor McGarry, all in favor? Okay, to the regular agenda then. Uh, the first, there, there are no um, presentations, so, uh, but there certainly be questions. Uh, staff are here to, uh, to answer. So the first one is um, the project approval for the King Street East uh, Highway 401 overpass the Freeport Bridge Sports World Drive project. Are there any questions in that regard? I have one. Um, there is a developer uh, who has asked that uh, the phasing of this project be um, be changed um, so that 
uh, or, or that certain phases maybe take place concurrently. Uh, this has to do with the hoop lands and um, and uh, those those particular lands uh, and the access point that is being uh, provided to that project from King Street East, south of the Freeport Bridge, um, and so there. Uh, there was some question whether or not um, doing it in the reverse order uh, would benefit that, and I don't know if, if staff is aware of that or not. Um, I believe I believe um, uh, staff were contacted by the uh, by the developer. I just want to get a response as to whether or not that's possible, whether or not that's advisable, uh, and. Um, even necessary because I, I know that that linkage is also dependent on a railway uh, grade separation, uh, which is not going to happen uh, overnight uh, as well. So uh, is, is there any staff that could address that? Um, Mr. Bauer? Uh, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the timing is, uh, the staging has been planned uh, with the south end first, primarily because the road there is in the poorest condition and, and most urgent need of reconstruction. Also the work at the north end closer to, um, to the uh, highway, the MTO crossing requires MTO approvals. So there could be some uh, additional time required to obtain those approvals. That being said, uh, we can certainly review um, the method by which we can accomplish or provide that access, whether it's uh, at the same time as construction or whether there's some temporary works that might be done initially, we can certainly review that. So there shouldn't be an issue? I, I don't foresee an issue with providing an access there. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing I think uh, I'll ask the question, I think, um, is that uh, ION Stage 2 goes through this particular corridor. So um, I think it's in the report, but I just want to hear that the um, the underground utilities are all going to be located appropriately, so that we will not have to uh, go back again and uh, and do any additional work uh, in that regard. Yes, uh, that that is correct. Uh, there's an eight meter wide uh, center median being uh, reserved for the future LRT uh, line there. Okay. All right, uh, motion to uh, approve the project. Councillor Harris, Councillor Clark, all in favor? It's carried. The next item is uh, the Fisher Holman Road Improvements, the archaeological study that's been referred to. Um, pretty significant finding uh, and, um, and some significant cost associated with investigating it and significant uh, closure of the road, um, which you know is going to be uh, be difficult. So, um, any questions in that regard? This is really to uh, amend a, an agreement, a consulting agreement. Um, so. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. One, one is um, how, how, how much do, or how, how certain are we that the road needs to be closed for that length of time? Is this really dependent on initial findings? Uh, could it be shorter? Could it be longer? Is this just uh, the seven months is having that road shut down for seven months? Um, uh, there are some retailers in the area that are not looking forward to uh, this closure. Uh, the detour is long and uh, difficult. Um, so is there a period of time during which it has to be shut down, but there may be an additional period of time where traffic can be reinstated uh, while the, uh, the study is, is underway or just two lanes or a small diversion or whatever, have we looked at all the possibilities associated with that and whether or not, um, are we just being cautious in, in saying seven months? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. So uh, it is an estimate. 
It could go, it could be longer, it could be shorter. There are two components of the work that require the road closure. One of them is the archeological investigation and the other is the installation of the new culverts on Strasburg Creek. Both of those require road closure, which is why they're being done at the same time. There is some uncertainty about what we might find under the road for the archeological study. And we are trying to be reasonably conservative in estimating the time for that. We're hoping it might be less, but we, uh, it could potentially be longer. Um, there is archeological work that will be happening alongside the road that will continue. Uh, we will be able to open the road while some of the archeological work along the shoulders and the ditches uh, still is underway. So we will get the road open as soon as possible. Councilor Verbanovic. Thank you. Just uh, further to your, uh, your questions, uh, Chair Galloway, I'm wondering uh, when we went out to, to tender um, with this, did we contemplate because of the, the impacts to the area, um, you know, a, a mechanism that perhaps would have allowed, particularly during the, the, the summer months when days are longer and so on, um, them to, um, you know, work two shifts potentially, um, working on the project, different things like that, that could, that could expedite um, one or both of the aspects of the project in order to minimize the impacts on, on, on that part of town. Uh, again, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I believe there would be some challenges with trying to do the archeological work uh, in multiple shifts. We'd have an issue with the amount of personnel and the number of personnel working there. Um, we also have typically challenges with noise and so forth in adjoining areas if we do work at night. We also have significant challenges with contractors being able to provide two crews to work multiple shifts during the week. So in most cases, if we're doing night work, it's, uh, we, we're not working during the day, it's for traffic. Uh, it's to avoid disruptions during uh, the day at, at peak traffic times, but not for an extended period of time like this. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I wasn't talking about night work. I was talking about you know a scenario, for example, where they're working seven to seven, um, and and you know timing their staff accordingly and so on. It just I've I've, I've seen this with with various projects. I mean even um, you know Weber Street as an example. There were chunks of Weber Street that there was very little happening, and I take that last year as an example. Take that route every day. Um, as does the chair and, and, and others. And there were days where there was very little to, to nothing going on. In fact, sometimes it felt like, you know, a week would pass by. Um, and I get some of that is waiting for ground settling and having to deal with different uh, piping at different times and, and, and things like that. But I, I just think we need to rethink where we can. Um, our approach to some of these projects um, and consider impact. On, on the broader community. Um, and, and I mean, Weber Street became overly complicated because we also saw closures on a number of other streets as well, which is a, a broader coordination issue that I think has been raised as well. Um, so I, it, it may be too late for, for this. I don't know if, if this is a conversation. In fact, I, I would like to ask that this, that, that conversation happen with, with Wood Canada between now and and uh, this coming to, to council next week um, and exploring what possibilities might be available to shorten the, period, the, the, the construction time. Okay, can I staff to have that conversation and whether or not it's possible or not? Um, the, um, I've got two more questions. One is, um, what will we be able to do for cyclists and pedestrians through this corridor? There is no acceptable detour for cyclists and pedestrians um, through this corridor. Is, is that access going to be maintained during the seven month period? Uh through you, Mr. Chair, we, we did consider that and there is no possible way for us to maintain a pedestrian and cycling access, particularly with the culvert and the creek crossing there um, and with the archaeological work being underway. So it's just not going to be possible for us to maintain that access. 
Well, I think the uh, the contractor is going to have to anticipate intrusion into the site somehow or another because if you think of it, I mean, cars can detour easily, and but pedestrians and cyclists, I mean, the the detour is kilometers uh, in in nature, and. Um, we don't have any other facilities anywhere in the neighborhood to uh, to accommodate that. So, as long as that's been uh, has been considered and uh, has been looked at, um, I don't know what could be built on on a temporary basis or whether or not that's even possible. And certainly, the culvert issue is. Uh, the other question I had is, uh, we are scheduled to do the roundabout at Bleams and fisher Holman. Uh, well, last year, this year, and now next year. Um, is there any reason why it could not be built this year when the road is shut, as opposed to building it when the road is reopened in the subsequent year? Um, and I know that doesn't, I mean, there's four legs to a roundabout and it only would affect one leg, but um, I'm being asked by, by people, uh, why is the roundabout not being built at the same time the road is closed? I believe we have it designed, I believe it's all ready to go, it's just uh, the way it's being phased. Um, so there's a couple of uh, reasons for that. One of them is, um, the storm drainage from the new roundabout, we need to get the work done near the culvert and the regrading of the road to provide storm drainage for the new roundabout. And um, also, we'll be doing preparatory work this year as part of this contract uh, to avoid having to do a full closure, extended full closure next year. There will be some short-term closures for certain operations, but it won't be a season-long closure the way it will be this year. So preparatory work will get done to limit the amount of closures required next year. It's an awful lot of work to get done in one year regardless, so. Chair Redman. Thank you. Um, further to your comment about alternative um, uh, egress for bikes and pedestrians, is there a standard um, communication plan that goes along with letting people know that this is no longer a viable access and what alternative uh, routes are and um, that kind of information, not only the signage, but um, disseminated um, broadly within the community and specifically in that area where people would choose that route normally? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. So we will be sending out notices to that area. We'll be putting up signs. We'll have information on our website. So we'll do our best to broadcast that as broadly as possible and provide information about alternative routes. Uh, the other thing I will add is that um, there may be some possibilities, and we'll certainly take a look at getting some sort of temporary facility open sooner than perhaps the road can be open to vehicles if that is possible. So we may be able to shorten the duration of the closure for the pedestrians and cyclists. That'd be a good idea if it's possible, yeah. Okay, there's a motion to, uh, it's really a, the, the contract uh, for the archeological work and then a, uh, a change in scope to the um, to the other consultant. Motion, Councillor Clark, Councillor Lorenz. Oh, you wanna speak? Are you seconding it? Yes, I speak. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yep, thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, I share all of your concerns, but honestly, this is no surprise. We knew this was coming. In fact, they wanted to do it earlier and we've kind of put it off. So, the archeological thing we knew? No, not the archeological, oh. but the two, the twin box. box oh box. yes, that yeah. was, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it is what it is, and I think people will just have to realize that uh, it's going to happen. I mean, I, when we built the LRT, there was a lot of people that were inconvenienced, and now they benefit from it. So it's unfortunate, but uh, it's going to be a, a bit of a mess out there for a while. Okay, all in favor? That's carried. The next item is the uh, Grand River uh, Transit U-Pass contract updates. Uh, so we have updates on uh, most of all the contracts we have and some <coughs> are ready to go ahead. I think there's one that's subject to a referendum. Is there any questions 
on uh, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm fine with the recommendations, but I was surprised at the variation uh, in the, um, the fees. I, I had imagined that everybody would pay the same, and I'm wondering whether I can get a sort of high-level explanation of how those calculations are done. Is it simply smaller student bodies have higher costs? Has it to do with routes? How do we, how do we determine those, those fees? Mr. Zing? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the rates would be uh, for all five UPASS uh, agreement participants would be the same at the end of this uh, five-year period. So um, Conestoga College, which doesn't have a UPASS uh, at this time, is, is different. Mm -hmm. um, that had, was projected out based on uh, the challenges of servicing that area uh, and uh, the difficulty is not being as central to other services. Uh, but the other five agreements are the same after the first, uh, first year, and I believe starting September of 2021, they would be the same. A follow-up question? So the, 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 the referenda that have to happen, is that, uh, what, are the what are the students voting on? Whether they want to participate, are they voting on the fees? How frequently does that happen? That doesn't happen annually. To you, Mr. Chair, it's, a, um, it's not an annual referendum. It's a five-year arrangement now. This would be five-year, well, four-year renewal for, it's one-year continuation and a four-year renewal for the three groups um, that would start in 2021. And it is uh, mostly based on price, but there are some changes to the contract as well proposed. Okay, thank you. Okay, no further questions. So I wish to move uh, the uh, motion. Councillor Fox and Chair Redmond, all in favor? That's carried. The next item is uh, the Low Income Transit Program update. Any questions on that? Moved by Councillor Strickland, seconded by Councillor Erb. All in favor? That's carried. The last item then is a second, yeah, um, no, one more, two more items. Uh, the drinking water summary report, uh, starting on page 88. Are there any questions, Councillor Lorenz? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm not sure if this is the, uh, the, the appropriate place to, uh, to ask this, but I'm going to anyway, and it's dealing with uh, with uh, our programs about Smart About Salt and uh, the the, uh, the the swim pond, um, uh, the, uh, a whole uh, idea and configuration of storm management ponds in in all of the the urban municipalities. Um, as you know, um, a, a lot of water drains into those ponds, and then uh, uh, they 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 get silted out, and the water moves on through the system down to uh, to the Grand River, but my understanding is that uh, we're starting to do tests on these ponds twice a year now to look for uh, um, for, for high concentrations of uh, salts or or anything else, and and I guess that's a good thing. But I, I don't understand what the outcome would be. I, it's almost like the uh, the horse is out of the barn, and now we're worried about uh, the amount of salt and, and and chlorides that we put down on our roads, not only privately but publicly. And uh, now we're testing for it. And what what is the outcome? What happens if we stumble across a, a pond somewhere uh, 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 down by Sports World that has a high concentration of of salts or chlorines or selenes or whatever you want to call it? Whose responsibility is that to be? Is it can can it be cleaned up? Whose responsibility is it? And how do we how do we get ourselves out of what we've created over the last twenty or thirty years by? dumping all this stuff on our roads and highways for years and years and years and years. Now it seems like we're paying, paying the price of it, but who is? Mr. Schmidt? So the, the majority of those swim ponds would actually be with the local municipalities, uh, so there might be one or two that are ours. My guess, and we can follow up on this, is that the testing is being done not for the purposes of doing any re remediation work or anything on those ponds, but those ponds do need to be excavated out occasionally, so they require mm -hmm. maintenance. 
and the issue of the quality of what you remove and how you deal with that is, is a major concern. If it is considered contaminated, you have to deal with that soil very differently than if it's not contaminated. So I suspect if people are doing testing, it's largely to see and determine what are they going to do with that soil when they do a clean out. I'm not sure if anyone else has any different information. That's my understanding. But I can follow up with my counterparts at uh, the local municipalities and see why they're doing well, that testing. The source protection that we're responsible, the region is responsible for water quality, right? The, these these ponds yeah. from a, a source protection perspective, uh, most and any new ones are not designed as infiltration ponds. So they don't infiltrate into the groundwater, they discharge into the, the Grand River. So yes, there's still a concern with water quality. And if they are designed, some of them are designed to provide some uh, benefits uh, in retaining silt and, and keeping those types of things out of the river, but they're not they're not really primarily a quality control or improvement device. They're largely to control flow. So if they if you find a pond that I mean I don't know how you even test for it, but road salt, um, high concentrations of salt in a storm pond that means nothing. We just let it flow, keep flowing, or. Is there some way of treating that? Is that what silt is? Is it road salt? I thought it was more of sand and topsoil and all the things that kind of blow around and get caught and then end up there. So you understand what I'm saying? So yes, yes. So okay. road salt largely, once it's dissolved in water, there is little that we can do to stop that from flowing either into the river or into the okay. ground. So there's really not. So if a pond was tested for a high amount of salt water in it. There's nothing we it, would do about it. It just keeps. It, uh, and I doubt if anyone's testing for high salt water in the pond. I suspect they're testing the sediments in the pond, and they would be testing for potential salts, other other contaminants. Uh, some of them are natural. So some of the contaminants in a, a pond, actually uh, hydrocarbons are produced by the vegetation. So believe it or not, the vegetation growing in the pond contaminates the soil in the pond. And uh, what some of the cities have done is in some of the newer ponds, they provided areas where they can, when they, when they pull out the silts, they pull the silts, they can pile them beside the pond, and then basically it's waiting. If you wait a period of time, it remediates itself, and then you can use that soil in different locations. If, the, if that soil is contaminated, either contaminated because the soil has high levels of salt in it, or other contaminants, then you can't just put that anywhere. You have to put that in specific locations, a landfill or a designated landfill. But it is, I, I would suspect the testing is being done in the sediments in the pond, not the water quality in the pond. Okay, so, and, and you may, I'm not a, a tough scientist, but you're saying that there is a possibility that some salt doesn't dissolve and it goes into, turns to it, silt or? It, it's possible that there's salt, that there's solid salt in, in, the, in the pond, or it's possible that the, uh, the salt is in some of the sediments and, and is caught there and infiltrates there. Okay. So are we gonna get an update after we get through this winter season on salt usage and smart about salt, all the things that we're using to try to, uh, to make a difference? Sure, I, th I think we've been doing those types of updates. We can do one in the summer on, on how our, uh, our salt program has been both on our roads and, and work we've been doing through Smart About Salt and others. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Jowett. Oh, thank you, through the chair. Um, so I just wanted to um, ask a couple of questions around some of the points that Jeff has made. So we recognize that source protection uh, is the water quality and that's our responsibility and certainly just like the rural water um, program, uh, so I guess our role is advise, monitor, educate, respond, mitigate whenever we can. But I think one of the bigger barriers, if I'm just being clear here, Thomas, is that the province, uh, pro provincial changes in legislation are, are what we need to support any other behaviors around the water quality. Is that correct? On, on salt, I think the, the big issue, so we do a lot of work at our roads program and the local municipalities do a lot of work to make sure we use the minimum amount of salt in order to meet a spe specified standard. So we do have a service level standard. That standard is designated by the province. And I would say it's also expected by our customers. So people do expect us to maintain 
a, a very high level of, of road during during the winter. So that that's mm -hmm. essentially legislation on the, uh, the uh, particular on the private side. Uh, there's liability requirements. So any private business mm -hmm. is is hiring someone, and we do have programs for for people that are doing maintenance to minimize the amount of salt that they use. But clearly, they, if someone slips and falls, there are liability issues, and, and people, I would say, generally tend to err on using more salt rather than less, even if we do provide all the education and training to minimize the amount of use of salt. So I, I suppose legislatively, if there were changes on liability for slips and falls, that could have an impact on how much salt is used. Yeah, so anybody even clearing their sidewalks tends to put more on so they don't have to come back again you know, as frequently, right? Yeah, there, there's, yes, that's, even though we recommend don't use the minimum amount of salt, I think we have on, online available all the information on one temperature you should be salt, salting, when you should be using sand, but I would say many people are, are, don't have that information for the uh, commercial type uh, uh, maintainers. There is education and there's training. And there are many, many places that require uh, these maintainers to have sort about salt certification. So they actually have the certification so they're fully informed on how to apply salt, when to apply salt, how much salt to apply. So we could literally increase our awareness activity if we felt that the parts per million were becoming uh, something that required a more aggressive stance? Is, is that what we would look at doing? I think we're already doing a, a, a lot of, of public ed education. Uh, I think the, the problem is we have a lot of sidewalks, we have a lot of, of roads, and uh, there are impacts on our wells, and it's very difficult to make changes in that. So all I'm, I'm going back to is the days of hearing, be nice, clear your ice. So I, I, I hope, I, I'm going to go and look at the website, and maybe there's some things we can do better or different even at GRCA to support some uh, of those concerns. I think we do work with the, the GRCA of course you do, on, yeah. on, on that. Uh, and we can provide, if we'd like, we can circulate that information to all of council, because we have an ongoing program that we run this, this winter, both uh, online and on, uh, on radio. So we can circulate that information so that all of council can see. Okay, thanks. Councilor Shantz. Thank you. Um, I, there, there's a few different pieces to this problem. Uh, one is public education we talked about. Uh, the other is, is usage of salt. And then there's the issue of um, salt and other soil contaminants. And I, I think they're separate. I think for the most part, salt will dissolve in water and, and sit in the water unless it, it evaporates. Um, so I guess what, what's going through my mind, I was reading recently about, a, and I forget which country it was, but they're, they're using solar to desalinate seawater. And so we live in a very intelligent part of the province. We've got all kinds of mines here. I wonder if there's any way to, um, to, to work with the universities, uh, maybe GRCA and the region, to uh, look at potential solutions to, to clean up. Because I don't think that uh, public education and usage is going to totally clean it up. We've already indicated that there's salt in some of our aquifers for, for drinking water, and we're having to deal with that. So um, perhaps there's a smart solution out there somewhere. And if we can uh, tap into that or encourage that, that would be a good thing. The, uh, the technologies to remove salt are, are pretty well known. It's, it's a reverse osmosis type of process. So very similar to if you went and bought a unit for underneath your sink to remove contaminants, that's the same type of unit that you would use to remove salt. And uh, really the issue on that is one, the high cost of the technology and the high cost of the energy required to run it, which is the solar part is probably providing the electricity to run that reverse osmosis process. And there are, are places in the world where they have uh, not enough drinking water available, where they do desalinate water in order to make it drinking water. Trying to do that on a aquifer scale, I think would be very cost prohibitive to do. Okay, um, follow up, yep. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I understand it's it's expensive and it's um, bulky. It, it's not a, an easy thing to do at this time. But as I said, there are some great minds out there, and and things that we thought were unsolvable have been solved. So perhaps the perhaps some young up and coming scientist will have an epiphany and find an easier way. Sure. Okay, no further questions. We have a recommendation to accept the, uh, the drinking water report. Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Foxton, all in favor? That's carried. The last item then is the, um, the uh, tax increment grant to grant for 270 Spadina Road East. Is there any questions in regards? to that item, a very successful and very expensive program we have. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Radovic, seconded by Councillor Schantz. All in favor? That's carried. Um, oh, and other, other business? Um, I think we have a couple items. Um, um, Project of the Year Award for King Street in uh, Uptown Waterloo. Eric? Eric Saunderson here. I think we just wanted to just wanted to, to give an opportunity for Eric to bring the award forward so we could uh, see it and, and also an opportunity to do a photo opportunity with, with you. But I'm not sure, Eric, do you have anything you'd like to say about why we got the reward? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't planning to, but uh, certainly <laughs> ahead, could add a few words. It's a great project. Go ahead. Yeah, it certainly has been uh, a challenge, uh, to say the least, over the past couple of years. Uh, uh, throughout this project, uh, involved numerous stakeholders and people throughout the planning, design, and construction process to make this a success. And this uh, award certainly speaks uh, to those contributions throughout the project. I'm quite pleased to present this to committee today. I could just say that uh, I was pleased to represent the region at the kind of official opening, the uptown uh, area, and Eric was there, and appropriately, he and his family arrived by bicycle, uh, as I did as well, but uh, it was certainly uh, a good day, and uh, the people in the uptown area were really happy, not just, <laughs> not just for the finished product, but uh, that it was done. <laughs> and uh, and all those associated. So congratulations to uh, to you, uh, Eric, and of course to all uh, design and construction staff associated with the uh, with the project. Thank you. And Chair Redmond. Oops, sorry. I thought you had powers that I <laughs> I do, but they go with sitting in that seat. <laughs> um, I'd like to add my uh, voice of uh, congratulations to Eric Sanderson and the team as well. And it's an appropriate segue. Um, as you may know, we're celebrating Employee Appreciation Week this week. The region has over 3,500 employees working in diverse departments, division, and program areas. Over the past year, I've had the opportunity to visit with staff in a number of different departments and locations. And I've been so impressed by so many different specialties and levels of expertise of our employees. This organization is so lucky to have staff who are passionate about public service, actually as passionate as we are as elected officials. Our employees work hard every day to implement Council's vision for Waterloo Region. They truly care about this community and they take pride in their contributions. So colleagues, I would encourage you to take the time to interact with and recognize staff this week and throughout the year. For staff who are here today and to the thousands who are not, I want to thank you all for what you do to make our community great. Thank you very much.
A motion to adjourn. Councilor Fox and Councilor Herb, all in favor? Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning. We're back live on the webcast. Call the Administration Finance Committee to order. Are there any uh, declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we have no delegations, no presentations. There's a report on the Community Innovation Grant there with a recommendation. There is some housekeeping changes to the, to the kind of uh, governing uh, principles for the grant. And then staff are recommending that we allocate the $50,000 based on the successful applicant for uh, making affordable housing more available to individuals and families. So, Councillor Herb will move it. I have a seconder. Councillor Nowak, all those in favor? All right, that's carried. Thank you very much. I promise next ANF meeting will be busier. Uh, the um, information correspondence seeing none, council requests, other business, next meeting, motion to adjourn. Oh, oh, geez, I shouldn't have said anything, I guess. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Chair Edmund. Chair Strickland, you were like watching a little kid run downhill there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually pushed it when you were reviewing the community grants, and that's just to say that I'm really pleased to see the changes and the revisions. They are the result of public input. So yeah. the changes in that program were actually the result of recipients saying that we needed to simplify it. and not be uh, quite as rigorous asking for audited statements for small groups that um, are unable to do that. So it's a great refinement to a very good program. Yeah, it'll open it up to more uh, community agencies for sure. So we've, uh, I think we passed it already. So uh, motion to adjourn. Uh, Councillor Fox and Councillor Harris, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you very much.